I like that little audio bit there that I've got. That's actually taken from an album I never, ever released. Uh, I was just telling Dave Drop. off air. <laughs> D, isn't it? That I recorded an album way back when. <laughs> sent out links to it to about 200 people. Thought, hey, nobody's gotten back to me. I must totally suck. And then found out a year later I sent out a dead link. And I never followed things up. But, yeah, that was some of my music. <sighs> Good morning, folks. I the coffee started the, uh, the drop D. It was in drop D. <laughs> Who's that talking? There's somebody out yeah. there. There must be a cool cat outside somewhere there. I wish they'd ring the doorbell. Who's that? Hello, it's Dave Kilminster. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Good evening. Good morning, in fact. Now, Dave, yeah. as I was throwing over to my Facebook group, I mentioned that you are in Mexico City. What yes. the hell are you doing in Mexico City, man? It's a very, very good question. Um, towards the end of the last Roger Waters tour, I had a bit of a nasty accident. I broke three of the metatarsals in my left foot and fractured my right ankle. So I finished the tour in, on a wheelchair. Um, I think we did the last nine shows on, in a wheelchair. Um, which is a little frustrating. Wow. But obviously, once, once we'd finished, I'm in Mexico City in the, in a wheelchair, and everyone's going, right, yeah, see you, bye. So um, so I stayed here for a while uh, until I could walk again. Then I started going for physio. Then I met a girl. And um, then I sold my house in England. So I've kind of been spending most of my time here i mean the weather's nicer for for start so um yeah i'm probably heading back to england soon because i need to finish my album which is another that's another story but yeah so spending a long long time here cool it's three years yeah it's not the kind of place that it's like that you'd spring to mind hey i'm gonna relocate i know mexico city not that i've ever been there it's probably a lovely place and that's most probably why you you've chosen to stay there i, I take it well, it, it's my girlfriend's Mexican, so it kind of makes sense, really. Um, but we'll be hopefully heading back to England at some point in the near future. Nice. As I said, I have lots of work to do once I get back. Um, cool. Yeah, but this is there's there's definitely worse places to be. <laughs> so, Dave, as I said, I, I know that you're the um, lead guitarist for the Roger Water Group, and I'm sure you've done a lot of other things over the years as well. That's a really cool gig to have. That is a seriously cool gig to have. Oh, it's it's, a, it's amazing. It's totally amazing. I, I joined, um, wow, 15 years ago, just over 15 years ago, was the first tour I ever did with Roger, which was the Dark Side of the Moon tour, 2006 to 2008, and then we did the War tour. So um, we've been in Australia a few times, actually. I do um, remember you were here not that long ago. Well, I say that, you know, it was a couple of years back. Um. Yes, it was early 2018. I, I, I did see some people um, post some videos from your show at uh, Brisbane Entertainment Centre, and it looked amazing. Okay, yeah, no, it was a, it was a cool show. We finished up in Perth, um, which was lovely. And as I'm as we finished the the last gig, I'm checking the weather reports for going back to England, and there was this huge storm called the beast from the east um it was all going all over europe and i thought you know what i'm gonna stay in perth so i stayed there for a few weeks um and not only that but uh i noticed that queen who were probably my favorite band ever um they were due to play the same venue that we just played they were playing there the next week so uh, i went along and had a chat with brian again and, uh, so that was really cool nice Nice. So you you yes. you know Brian then? Yes. Well, no, I'm not well, but yeah, I've met him a few times. And yeah. He's yeah. a lovely chap. I mean, he's just. I mean, Queen were the reason. Queen are the reason that I do what I do, to be honest. Wow. There's, um, you know, I heard Bohemian Rhapsody in uh, 1975, and at the time, it just encapsulated everything that I was into. Um, I was playing piano. I, this was before I even played guitar. I was playing piano. I was singing in a barbershop quartet at school. 
and um, and I was listening to rock music. I'd go around to my friends after school sometimes, and he played Black Sabbath and Stadium Square, Pat Travers, whatever. And this song just seemed to encapsulate everything that I loved in in one masterpiece, really. I mean, the solo was just. It's probably the best guitar solo for a, for a pop song. Probably the best guitar solo ever, maybe. I don't know. It's just um, there's something about that whole that whole song, the video. It was magical. So um, I asked my mother for the album for Christmas, and uh, <coughs> that was the beginning of my musical journey, I guess. Or, wow. You know, the the rock end of it anyway, the guitar playing end of it. Yeah. So yeah, big fan. So awesome. when, when you meet someone like that, it's like, oh my god, you're Brian May. This is this is a big deal. Cool, cool. You know, I, I've um, I've never met Brian, but I know several people that, that know him, and they all say the same thing that he's just a, a lovely guy. Um, he really is. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of people I'm, I'm friends with through Facebook and through just the the whole YouTube thing that I've played in bands with him and stuff. One of them, Jamie Humphreys is one of them. I know you've played with Jamie as well. I have. Yeah, yes, I've yeah. known Jamie for many years, um, almost thirty years, maybe. Yeah, actually, yeah. I knew him when he had hair. <laughs> he had really long blonde hair. I mean, many... <laughs> he won't mind me saying that. I, I've but, seen um, photos. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's when I first met him. Probably early, early nineties, early to mid nineties, I guess. In fact, he's the guy that's produ- producing my album, or is, is going to mix my album uh, later this year. Nice. Although it's probably going to be early next year now because uh, we're still stuck in Mexico. <laughs> but uh, yep, yep. Yes. No. Jamie's a lovely chap, and obviously he's um, yeah. He, he got to to play play with Brian a few times. Um, in fact, we used to joke because he's a huge Pink Floyd fan, and I'm a huge Queen fan. So we used to sort of joke that we've got each other's gigs. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know. Such as life. I'm, Such as life. I'm not complaining. Yeah. As, as you said, the the Roger show is just one of the best things that could could happen to anyone. Basically, it's just yeah. I, can, I can't imagine a bigger, better show for me to do. Um, I still pinch myself sometimes. It's uh, yeah. Awesome. Weird. Awesome. Life so, is weird. So you were saying <laughs> that um, Bohemian Rhapsody pricked your ears up and started the the rock and roll journey. Did yeah. you start playing I mean, guitar was- soon after that? Yes, probably five months after. Um, I still wanted to play piano. I was still trying to be Keith Emerson. Um, but uh, we didn't have a piano at home, and it was just a constant source of frustration. I could hear music in my head, and I just wanted to play something, anything. So the guitar was almost like, oh, let's just, let's just get a guitar because it's easy and it's portable. And so I ended up getting a, a classical guitar from, from school. And just uh, teaching myself from, with that. Um, but then again, I was still, you know, in my head, I was still listening to classical music, progressive music. Um, and the radio in the 70s was just amazing. You know, just everything from Michael Jackson to Black Sabbath, from Bob Marley to the Eagles to, you know, Heat Wave. Um, great disco band, um, just everything. They would play everything in one radio, uh, one two-hour radio set. It was just, um, and I loved it all. I really did. I think I think it's kind of a shame nowadays that you have specific radio stations like um, classical stations or jazz stations, you know, jazz or um, you know, country stations. Or whatever. It's like it's all music. Just put it all on the same program. You know, I think it just helps to broaden the mind, really. Well, that's you know, my. I, I, t- I totally agree. Like when I started playing guitar, and that, I was more late eighties picking it up, and that was my main source of of inspiration was um, the radio because there was actually guitar music on the radio, unlike today, uh, and yes. and it was all so varied, and. Uh, mm. And the stuff that they were playing on the radio, I found, was a bit more achievable, more melodic kind of things, as opposed to the, the shred stuff that was out there that was indecipherable for me. What the hell was going on at the time? But yeah, I agree that uh, the yes. radio was 
a big one. So yeah. what was what was your first electric yeah, totally. guitar? My first electric. Mm. Oh, that was a um, it was a a copy, obviously of a it was a it was a Shaftesbury copy of an SG. And um, yes, you probably never heard of it. They obviously died to death. Um, <laughs> and then shortly after that, I tried tried to do that in for a guild. Then I had an Ibanez. Then I started investigating because I I knew what I wanted, but no one was making a guitar that I liked. You know, I knew that I wanted the really high frets, and I love the V-shaped neck. I don't like the big C shapes because I've got fairly small hands, so the V is more comfortable to my hands. Um, so I, I just embarked on this journey of, of getting people to make custom guitars for me until I kind of came across um, Sir in the last sort of ooh, ten years, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Sir Guitars will be making making. Uh, making these things for me. In fact, I have one here. Let me show you. Cool. Let's have a look. This is the latest one. Um, it's essentially Telecaster, Telecaster body, obviously. Three singles, tremolo, um, nice high frets, swamp ash body, and it's been electrocuted. Aha. Uh -huh. It's actually a, a natural finish where they sort of plug it into the mains like uh, Frankenstein's monster and then uh, it creates all this all this lightning effect uh, which actually burns into the body as you can feel it it's got a kind of got a grooves to it it's amazing I've seen those yeah that's very cool that's cool. And, and, and it's funny, mate. Um, I've actually got somebody has asked, hey, Dave, I noticed your guitars are Telecaster style, but with three pickups and a Strat bridge. Do you mind telling us yes. a bit about yes. it? Uh, sure. I just never got on with Strat-shaped bodies. They just feel too big for me. Really? Um, and they don't feel like they even hang in the right place, which I think is to do with the top horn um, where the Strat like everything's kind of displaced over to the left. Um, and I, yeah, and I used to do this eight fingered stuff as well. And I found the top horn also interfered with getting my right hand onto the, onto the fretboard. So one day I was in a music shop and I saw this pink Paisley Telecaster on the wall. And I just thought that looks so cool. It's just second hand guitar. And I picked it up, and there was just something about it. It had a resonance to it, it had a ring to it, and uh, I just fell in love with it and bought it. And ever since then, which is probably mid nineties, pretty much all my custom made guitars are, are Telecaster shaped. Just they just fit my body better. But cool. I also like the, the versatility in pickup. Um, you know, I mean Telecasters. I, I I have a an old Gibson. That's Gibson. Say that again. I have an old Fender Telecaster from 1978, which has obviously got stock pickups. So if I need to do some country playing, or I did a reggae tune on my new album, and I just thought, yes, it's got to be the Telecaster, you know. But in general, I just like a few more options. So that's why. Um, I don't think the body shape makes that much difference in something like that. So it's essentially a, a Strat Tele hybrid that just sure. fits my body better. Yep, nice. You know, I've, I've noticed that you um, played a Richie yeah. Cotson Stratocaster, uh, so, sorry, uh, Telecasters as well. And I had one of those which I sold recently. Kind of yes. regret selling that. They're beautiful tellies, aren't they? Mm, yes. Yeah, it was actually one of Richie's, well, two of Richie's. I, I borrowed them for the tour because. When I got the job with Roger, I was I was broke, basically. <laughs> I was playing. I'd been playing with you know fairly famous artists, but it just it wasn't paying any money. So, um, so I get this audition for for Roger, and I'm thinking I need some decent get I need some decent gear. This is ridiculous. So, um, Richie had two two of his Telecasters in England for when he. He came to uh, to do clinics or whatever, so I just took those out for a couple of years. 
Nice, nice. His, yeah. his personal ones, huh? I, the only thing I did was change the pickups. I, yes, yes, yes. He's got them back now, obviously. But um, yeah. I'm sure he's got millions of, of guitars. The only thing I did is, is I changed the pickups. I didn't like the the, the pickups that, that it came with. But um, again, I'm just really fussy. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've kind of got a really good idea of what I like and what I don't like. So, yeah. yeah. And that's funny. We all know but what we uh, like. But the Sir things are amazing. I'm, I'm just... And what pickups have you got in the Sir? Yeah. What, what did but you arrive it's, at? It's impossible. Uh, they're, actually, they're actually Sir pickups. Um, they're called uh, ML, Mike Lando pickups. Nice. And um, they are gorgeous. Yeah, really, really nice. What do you like and about I've them? I've got those singles in, in pretty much all my... I like that they're they're kind of be- medium out, but I don't like the loud pickups. But I like them to pick up everything that I'm doing, you know. So they're very dynamic. They've got all the the highs and the lows and everything in between, um, but just really clean. Nice. So I I I never like these, you know, because they used to make these really loud pickups. Um, what was the Seymour Duncan one? The Invader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had an there's invader. Screws on it, and yep. there's, every time you sort of, yeah, <laughs> and you take the strings down on the treble, and all the, the strings just stick to the pickup, and you can't get them back off again because it was just so powerful. But I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I like um, medium output pickups, and I like all the, all the uh, overdrive to come from the amp itself rather than, the, rather than the guitar. So sure, yeah. Yep. Yeah, but they're, they're great. I, I tried a whole bunch of singles, um, and and so make great pickups anyway. But they, these these ones, I must have spent about six hours deciding. But these these were definitely my favourites. So cool. <laughs> it's really sad. Yeah, yeah. But it's um, you know, I'll I'll spend that time deciding which ones I want, and then then I don't have to think about it ever again. So it's perfect. <laughs> nice. Find something you like. Stick to it. It's funny. I used to think it was it was all about that. I used to love. Um, Sorry, you go. About the what? I um, I used no, to. Th- I, we've I'm got a fair bit of say. delay going on, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we've got that thing. We've so got we, a little bit of delay. Yeah, delay, yeah, delay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Dave, <laughs> can you? It's yeah. a little bit, a little bit jumpy. The picture that I've got of you uh, since we started streaming. Are you able to log out and log back sure. in? Uh, and I'll just see if that fixes things up. Uh, Sure. Maybe yeah, so. if that's handy for you. And I'll just see if that, if that fixes things. This seems to happen now and then. I'm not sure if it's my internet connection here. I'm hoping it's not. But Dave will come back in just a second and hopefully it'll be a bit smoother. And here he is once again. Hello, Dave. Uh, huh? That's better. Is that's that better? better? It is. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if that happens Great. again, I'll, I'll just get you to do that. Yeah, uh, it please might do. Refresh we, thing. we had some pro- problems with um, the internet, actually in in the whole country. So <laughs> that was earlier today. I thought, oh, this is perfect, perfect timing. Um, but yeah, if, if this is working now, I'm very happy. Yeah, yeah, it's good now. It, yeah. So you mentioned right. um, auditioning for Roger. How does one audition for Roger Waters? Um, that's a very good question. Yeah, what, what was the process? I, uh, I initially had a conversation with Snowy White, who put me in contact with Andy Fairweather, who was the other um, rhythm guitarist on the Dark Side tour. And he said, you know, they were looking for somebody very specific. They wanted someone that could play and sing like Dave Gilmore. And I thought, I don't know if I can sing like that. I mean, I could take up smoking, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. But so basically, I, I they asked me for some specific songs to record. So I, I spent the day in the studio just recording some bits. I, I found a a dodgy backing track for "Comfortably Numb." I put the solo down. Um, I did some stuff for "Money," uh, "Breathe," "Wish You Were Here." I think that was it. And then I, I actually dropped it off to Andy because I thought it'd be nice to, to meet him. 
I, I deal much better with people when I can see them. I, I've got a real aversion to, to phone calls, to speaking to people on the phone. If I can't see them, it's just it feels really weird. Yeah, right, yep. Um, so I went down there, I dropped the, the CD off. He said, look, I'm not going to play it while you're here, but just, yeah, I'll take, I'll give it a listen, let you know, whatever. So I get, get in the car, I'm driving back home. And he phones me up and he said, this is amazing. <laughs> we love this. Oh, cool. He said, hopefully we're just going to like it too. So yeah, so that really helped. Um, but then I had an actual audition, which was some ungodly hour of the morning in London. So I drove down there in, um, I actually borrowed a car because my car at the time was just very, very embarrassing. Um, so I borrowed someone's car to, to go down there. And I think they'd been auditioning for quite a while. You know, they 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 were getting to the end of their tether, basically. In fact, the guy that uh, they auditioned after me is a guitarist called Andy Latimer, who used to play in Camel. In fact, he still does play in Camel, I believe. Yeah, he must do. I, I saw him a couple of a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, they'd actually flown him out from LA to to London for the audition. So wow. they were like, we we definitely need a guitarist really soon. We've got these gigs coming up. So I was with him before before Andy, and um, I mean for me it was a total disaster. I mean just everything went wrong. Really, my my amp wasn't working. My acoustic guitar wasn't producing any sound through the PA. I'd forgotten my bottleneck because I obviously needed the bottleneck for "Wish You Were Here." Um, probably the worst thing actually was that um, okay they'd asked me to to play and sing like Gilmore, but because I wasn't a huge Floyd fan, I didn't actually know what he sang. So um, that was the, that was the beginning of the end for me. We, we um, Roger looked at me and said, "Oh, we're gonna let's, let's try money." I'm like, "Okay," and I, I felt quite confident. I was like, "Okay, do you want me to do the uh, da, 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 you know little funky thing, or do you want yep. me to do the riff or the uh, the thing with the tremolo one?" He said, "Oh, I, I don't care. Are you right on the lyrics?" I'm like, oh, you want me to sing this? Oh, so magically some lyrics appeared on a stand in front of me. There's the microphone and there's Roger standing like two feet away. And um, I mean, it's not a difficult, it's a slightly odd, odd, odd time signature. It's not a difficult thing to play, but obviously if you're going to play and sing it, you want to kind of maybe go through it once or twice before. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. And then obviously all my, my confidence has just gone out the window. And as I said, I plugged in the acoustic and the acoustic wasn't working and the amp stopped working. And we went into, um, oh, I don't know, it's just a whole litany of uh, disasters. And I, I walked out of there thinking, you've just blown the biggest gig of your life, Dave. You idiot. Um, and then they, cough, they called me up the next morning and said, oh, yeah, um, Roger would like to offer you the gig. Wow. Really? Yeah. So amazing. I have no idea what they saw in me. I, th I think, um, I think what, so what happened is what happened on my driving test where um, I was driving my own car and I felt pretty confident and there was this, um, this gap they have these barriers like six foot six gap or whatever and obviously you're supposed to slow down and because it was my car i just went through it 30 as normal i just and i thought oh, i should have slowed down they're gonna fail me so then i just kind of completely relaxed and i was just myself so i think by the end of the audition i just played something like the, the money so and i just kind of tore into it and um yeah i think they liked me I think maybe they liked me because I reminded them of their previous guitarist as well. Okay. Because you know, sort of, he had, um, I can't even remember his name. I'm so sorry. But, you know, he had the sort of necklaces and the black shirt and long hair, black curly hair, whatever. Um, oh, isn't that embarrassing? So you think image had a, had a bit to do with it then, huh? Maybe, maybe. Yep. I mean, R Roger wanted someone that's actually... You know, when it's your solo, you go out and you play your solo. And it doesn't really want anyone timid. 
you know, yep. to, to stand there gazing at your shoes or whatever. You know, you, when, yep. you, when it's your part, you go in the spotlight and you do your thing. Yeah. So maybe that's what they liked. I have no idea, actually. I've never dared ask them. I still can't believe they offered me the job. So. <laughs> that's a great feeling when you think you've totally blown something and, and you, you walk away um, dejected yeah. and then someone goes you hired you and what really <laughs> I didn't just completely eat shit then yeah, yeah. I just yeah no seriously I, th- I thought it was the worst I mean I, was, I thought I was prepared but I was so hopelessly un- unprepared and, and, and as I said not being a Pink Floyd fan I just didn't really I didn't get it <laughs> I didn't get what I was supposed to be doing. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. That, really amazing. Cool. Your, your picture is frozen a little bit on me at the moment. That's not okay. the most... Yeah, yeah. I can still hear you fine, though. That, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep keep chatting away. You've got me in the little corner there. I'm not there pulling to... a stupid face, am I? <laughs> you kind of are. You kind of are. <laughs> You I get frozen in here, pulling a yeah, yeah. It's, the it, it, it's a it's a ripper, mate. But that's okay. I, <laughs> I push on. <laughs> oh man, do you want me to restart again? No. Well, if it doesn't Sorry. come good in thirty seconds, well, I'll try. Um, you know right. what? No, no. Quickly, quickly, <laughs> try it again, mate. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll see you in a Let's second. Do this. Go. All right. That was a ripper face he was stuck on. I'm just going to take a chance, the opportunity, while Dave's phoning back in, just to let everybody know, if you are more inclined to uh, listen to the podcasts, that I am available on all the podcast sites as audio-only versions. Uh, And a like and a subscribe goes a long way. Let's check out if Dave is with us. There we go. He's not frozen. I'm back. I'm back. (laughs) So, yeah, it was a ripper face you were stuck on. Yeah, no, I think I think the guy's come off his bike or something. I think I think the the Wi-Fi is, is powered by someone on a little push. Yeah, yeah, That's the way I kind of, <laughs> okay. yeah. I've had to cha- change the uh, change the chain or something. No well, idea. that's okay. We 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 know now that if that happens, we can just log out and log yeah, back no, in that's, again. That's, and that's nice and easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, someone's just said Australia and ex- and Mexico equally bad internet. Yeah, that's. Sounds about right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Dave, when you when you were learning, when, once you got the gig, what was your process yes. in actually learning to to nail the parts? And while you start on on telling me that, I'm going to go quickly to the bathroom. So, are you good to just talk for thirty seconds while I? <laughs> sure. Well, you're, you're not going to be able to hear me. No, that's okay. But it'd be the quickest ever, mate. <laughs> yeah. Normally, when I'm wearing headphones, I I can go away and, and hear it, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I might have to go back and, and actually listen to what your answer was. I can't stand watching myself. I just let people know that when they go, oh, that bit where you were talking, blah, blah, blah. It's like, really? Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. The same. <laughs> so, totally if you same. can explain your learning process for the gig, I will be back right. in 30 seconds. And I'll, I'll talk to Buckethead in the background. Okay, go, Bucket. Hey, hey, Mr. Buckethead, how are you doing? Um. <laughs> My process, well, my initial process was just playing the music in the car because I wasn't that familiar with it, unfortunately. Um, And as I'm playing it in the car, I'm memorizing the songs, memorizing the lyrics, memorizing the arrangements. And I've got, I haven't got perfect pitch, but I've got a pretty good ear, so I can kind of work out most of what's happening harmonically before I even pick up a guitar. So, once I felt like I knew the material fairly well, I sat down and uh, transcribed everything. Just wrote all the guitar parts down. Um, What's that? (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yes. So, So briefly, I was just driving around listening to the music. You, you, you appear to have a uh, a, sp- <laughs> a chicken. I was going to use the. Uh, oh, I was going to. So, cow, isn't bu- it? Buckethead, <laughs> Buckethead can't talk back there, so he has a communication device. And okay, he says you did good. Oh well, thank you, thank you, thanks, Brian. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I must apologize. I, this, um, I do have like three coffees before I begin the podcast. Otherwise, I can uh, tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, you've got a very sleepy, dozy me. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah. Um, I just, I just try music like I, like I used to do. I, I don't. Oh, you don't know. You don't actually know anything about me. So, um, I used to write for a um, magazine called Guitar Techniques. Oh, cool. Um, I did over, I did over two hundred transcriptions, articles, lessons, whatever. And I also had a column in um, Guitarist for a while, and also Total Guitar. So I'm kind of quite quick at writing stuff down, basically. Um, and also not only writing it, but once I've written it, I can just read it. Because the thing with the gig, I wasn't actually sure who was going to play what solo or what rhythm part. So I just wrote everything out. Um, and then as, w as we're rehearsing, uh, we just kind of decide between ourselves who's, who's going to play... Um, who's going to play which solos. Um, I mean, at, at, at the time, I remember Snowy and uh, Andy just wanted to give everything to me. I, I don't know why, but I guess they figured you actually get the same money whether you, uh, whether you have the high-pressure spot or whether you're just <laughs> in the background playing rhythm. So. Sure, sure, yeah. And then Roger would come over and said, and, uh, Andy, you're not playing anything on this. Why don't you do the solo and... Yeah, Snowy, maybe you should uh, take over on this uh, thing. So that's, yeah, that's basically how we kind of um, dished out the parts. But I, I, you know, beforehand I just wrote everything out. I just wanted to be as, as prepared as possible. Cool, cool. Especially after my nightmare audition, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there, what, what's your favourite thing to, to play with, Roger? Like, is there a special moment where you get to step out front that you really like it. Your pitch is frozen again, but I'm just going to go with it, mate. I, I can oh hear you. God, seriously? Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I, 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 can, I can still hear you. And or? and the frozen picture isn't as bad this time, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we can try a reset in a few minutes, but just keep right. the flow of things, mate. Um, yeah, is sure. there a standout uh, part of the show for you where you go, yeah, this is my my moment to shine? Um, there's actually quite a few. Nice. Um, it's quite quite a few big... Floyd solos. I mean, you've got the the big solo in time. Um, wish you were here. I'm doing all the bottleneck stuff. Um, I think my favourite things are songs like Dogs, though. Um, Dogs has three guitar solos. Cool. Um, whole bunch of uh, harmony parts. Is um, interesting tuning. Don't ask me what the tuning is because I can't remember now. But it's an interesting tuning. <laughs> And um, yeah, actually, I have no idea. Wow, that's quite scary. But one of the the middle solo is the one where everything kind of just drops out. And um, yeah, there's lots of space. I love that. That's uh, that's probably one of my favourite bits. Um, maybe the the solo in money as well, because again, that's kind of three sections. But I play all of them I play the, the middle one when everyone else drops out it's, my favourite is when everyone drops out <laughs> it's just me yeah yeah because <laughs> then you can really feel it you can play a note you can kind of hear it you hear it coming off the back wall and it's like oh, yeah this is uh, life is cool <laughs> nice nice yeah, yeah. I, I can relate you, you were talking about Brian May uh, being a, a big influence in the early days and when I was playing with the Queen show I wasn't that big a um a Queen fan, uh, so it was ironic that I, I got the gig as well. But yeah, okay. playing that solo and standing on the you know, PA stacks and everything was it was quite a moment. Yes, Dave, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get you to quickly log out and log back in again and see if we get that picture going. And then I'm just going to ask you about some of the gear you used to recreate uh, Dave Gilmore tones. Sure. Okay, yeah. I'll be back in a sec. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, folks, this is why you tune into a live stream to catch a train wreck. And I'm thinking this isn't really a train wreck. This is going quite well. It's just that the picture keeps freezing up on us. And that's what happens when you're in Australia and Mexico and it's a bit of a on the whim of the internet. But Dave's back and he's moving again. <laughs> so, Dave, I, I said 
some of the gear that you're using, we've talked about your Telecasters, just to yes. uh, recreate some of the, the Gilmore tones, because we all know he's got a shitload of gear that he's got he, he in his racks, yes. and it's yeah. quite well documented. There's a lot of great websites out there that go right into what he uses yes. for particular areas. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, let's... I never got, got it into it heavily. Um I mean, I know he uses big muffs and things like that. I've never got on with a big muff, so I don't use it. Um, what I'd rather do is focus on trying to get the solos as close as possible, you know, with all the little bends and nuances and lists. And, you know, if I play, I figure if I play them as close as possible, then it's going to sound, it's going to keep Floyd fans happy, hopefully. Um, I used this example the other day because probably the, the most famous Floyd song in, in England is uh, Another Brick in the Wall. Yep. And on that guitar solo, he's playing a Les Paul, he's, and it's got um, P90s in it, and he's not even using his rack gear or amps, it's just going straight into the desk. Now, it still sounds like a Dave Gilmore solo. Doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, probably, it's one of my favorite things he's ever done. It, it sounds great. It really does. But I don't think Pink Floyd fans listened to that and thought, oh, wow, who's, who's that playing a, a Les Paul on a, on a Pink Floyd record? You know, it's, just, it's just, you know, the gear is important, but I think people make it a lot more important than it actually is. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tried, to, for playing-wise, I tried to get as close as possible with to the actual notes um for gear um yeah it was it was a bit of a nightmare we came out um we were coming out to doing the wall tour and there's a lot of clean guitar tones on the wall so i wanted a, an amp that would do great clean and great overdrive so i'm like i don't think that an amp exists that does that you know, and I, I really didn't want to go the way of Eric Johnson with his, um, you know, three different stacks kind of hissing and buzzing away in the background. I thought this is... So anyway, um, I discovered a, a company called Brunetti, uh, this Italian make. And the first thing I did, I plugged into this Brunetti Mercury and instantly it was just the perfect clean tone. Nice. I'm like, wow, this is really nice because there's certain things... I'm not going to go into different amps and what I don't like about them, but this is just, it was just a beautiful, warm, sparkling, clean tone. And then I switched on the overdrive and it was just the best overdrive I've ever got from an amp. I'm like, how have they done this? This is just, this is just, what wizardry is this? How is this even possible? Um, so I've been using the Brunettis since... Um, 2010 on everything that I've done because uh, they're just uh, they're just incredible. So 50 watt amp valves, EL34s. Um, I use two amps in stereo and um, two 4x12s with Celestian vintage 30s in them. Nice. Uh, um, for the for the gear, again, I, I wasn't trying to copy. I, I wanted to copy the sounds, but not actually the gear that David was using. So I knew I'd use a decent delay pedal, obviously. So um, I discovered this company called Strymon. So uh, I ended up getting, yeah, I think I had about five Strymon pedals on my board it, <laughs> towards the end because um, they just make such great stuff. Absolutely. Um, uh, what else? The full tone Deja Vibe is nice. Um, got MXR Phase 90. Um, the special Van Halen 35th anniversary model. Because it sounds better. The stripes actually make it sound better. I don't know what it is, but. Um. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's. Pretty much it. I'd, um, as I said, I didn't didn't get on with the big muff, so I ended up getting uh, a mini fuzz face. Cool. One of the Dunlop mini fuzz faces, which just sounds oh, it's wonderful. It's the the red Jimi Hendrix one, Band of Gypsies one. 
which sounds different from all the other fuzz faces, because um, I believe it was modelled on a an Octavia, but without the octave. All right. Uh, so yeah, it's got a very different sound to to any of the other fuzz faces, and it just it just seemed to work with the setup I had. Um, and obviously, to make all this stuff work, I needed a, a, an amazing switching system. So I've got the the, uh, the gig rig G2 made by um, that wonderful person, Daniel Steinhardt, um, who also made my uh, the pedal board I used for Steve Wilson as well. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Steve Wilson. I, I, I toured with him as well. No, I'm not. Um, there's some strange sounds going on here. Okay. There was there was a, there um, was a car just going past there that uh, revved revved oh, the crap out. Wow. Oh wow! You're probably hearing that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was really weird. Um, yes. So um, in between the wall tour and the uh, us and them tour, I, d I did a tour with uh, Stephen Wilson as well, and we actually came to Australia um, on that as well. Although I don't remember it because it was literally fly in, play the show, fly to the next one, play, fly, play, fly back again. So I just don't remember a lot of that at all. But um, it was a lot of fun. Touring can be a lot like that. I, I, it I did. Can be, yes. yeah. Yeah, I, I can remember reading something about Brian May saying that when he first started, it was such a whirlwind uh, tour that. Uh, he was asked about a particular city, and he said, "Yeah, the hotel room had nice curtains. That's about all he got to see." You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, it's very different with with Roger, um, because he cares so much about the show. He doesn't care about the expense, so we have a lot of time off in between shows, nice, so that um, everyone can sort of rest up, and so there's a lot of time for sightseeing, etc. Um, yeah, it's amazing. You know, I, as I said, I still can't believe the last uh, fifteen years of my life, really. But uh, yeah, it's it's the most comfortable you can be traveling, touring. Um, yeah, yeah. And one of the biggest bands ever. So that's nice. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I, that's that's the ultimate. That was almost always the ultimate goal for me in life was to see some of the world through just playing music and having that that paid holiday. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And. Living the dream, living the dream. And there, there you are in Mexico City. <laughs> What's your favourite city that, that you know that you're going to, that you go, yes, we're going to blah, blah, blah? Oh, there's lots in Europe. Um, lots of beautiful cities. Um, I love going to Prague. Um, Barcelona's lovely. Um, it's difficult to have a favourite because what happens is you tend to build these cities in your head almost. You know, you think, okay, we'd like the like the architecture of Prague, and we'd like the um, some of the music history of Vienna, and we'd like to have maybe a big lake in the middle. And you sort of design in this thing that doesn't actually exist, <laughs> if that makes any sense whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I've actually been giving that a lot of thought because um, I don't want to live in England. I'm going to um, emigrate at some point. Um, Probably after the next tour, uh, yep. but I'm not sure where we're going to end up yet. Well, you've seen enough um, of the world to, to make a, an informed choice, that's for sure, huh? I yes, yes. I mean, Italy's amazing. I love Italy. It's just um, you know, beautiful lights, beautiful architecture, amazing history. Just um, maybe Italy, maybe Greece. I don't know. Just somewhere that's not. A tiny island in the middle of nowhere that's just uh, decided to leave the EU for some inexplicable reason. We're, we're not going to get into politics, but let's just... <laughs> <laughs> Why <laughs> would anyone want to do that? It's so bizarre. And obviously, it's, it's a kiss of death for any English musicians that want to travel around Europe. Because now it's just ten times more complicated. Mm. And also for a European artist trying to, trying to visit England. But... It doesn't matter because you've got um, you've got a great uh, music scene in Australia. You think so? I'd, yeah, absolutely. I remember a scene um, when I was in Perth for a while. I went to this coffee shop and um, they were playing this band. I think it was called Ocean Alley, 
I don't know them. Um, there was a great tune. I ended up buying the album. Um, as a band called Pond. They're really cool. Yeah, you've got... The, the, I mean, f- well, from the outside, it seems like you've got a pretty good um, mu- music industry going at the moment. It ain't what it used to be. <laughs> it ain't what it's it used anything. to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like everywhere. I remember when I was a youngster, I, I live on a, a part of the Australia called the Gold Coast, which is just south of Brisbane. It's like big surfing beaches and the like. Oh, and, beautiful, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I've been there. You've been there, yeah, yep. And um, oh yeah, yeah. I used to be able to play every weekend. You frozen on me again. Oh no, you're back. Um, I used to be able to play a different venue every weekend and not play the same place twice for in six months. And now there's just nowhere left to play wow. where you can actually crank it up. And you said you're running two four by twelve cabs. You know, I've I've got two sitting right there, and it's. Not very often I get to, to crank those up. Um, no. But in terms of music coming out of here, yeah, there's always always something good if you go looking. I think that's a great thing with the internet is you can go looking for things that normally wouldn't be on the radio or so apparent in the mainstream these days. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm, mm. I got somebody there asking you about the strings you use. Oh. And I'm going to have to listen in because you've frozen up. Hopefully it'll come good. They but, are Didarios. I use Didarios on all my um, on all my guitars, uh, electric, acoustic, classical. Um, the ones I've got on most of my guitars are tens. I believe it's EXL one one zero, but I'm yeah. not. I wouldn't swear to it. <laughs> yeah. So no special coded strings or anything like that. No, no. I'm kind of really old fashioned. I like I like things to be as simple as possible. I mean, you can see that from the guitar. There's no, there's no paint on it. Straight away, as soon as you start painting things and lacquering it, it just affects the tone. So it's just two pieces of wood that are screwed together, and I don't know. It just seems more organic, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah, been using so, some yeah. the the coated elixirs for a little while now, and get a ridiculous mm-hmm. amount of life out of those, but. Um, a little bit expensive compared to others, right. so yeah, yeah. I think it depends on your sweat as well, because my I don't really sweat that much. So, you know, my guitars at home they, they they're quite happy for a year or two with the same set of strings. Yep, yep. Um, I'll ch- I'll change it more often if I'm touring, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. That's more for intonation purposes, and you know, you don't you don't want to risk breaking a string out there. Exactly. Crazy Gilmore bands. So, yeah. Speaking of breaking strings, I'm going to get you to log out and yes. log back in again to get your your, sure. um, your your vision going. But I want to ask you about any monumental fuck ups that may have happened as you're playing. You know, like yeah, solo oh, broke broke a string. Um, so I'll get you to log out, and log back in, and and have a think if there's anything that springs to mind. Oh, there definitely is. Hang on a sec. Okay, <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> As I say, folks, uh, this is the beauty of doing it live. Sometimes, you know, the internet connection isn't on our side, but I'm hoping that you persevere through. is isn't really affecting to those who are listening in on the podcast through the audio-only audio, audio only versions. But Dave is back, and he's moving. There he is. Yeah. All right. Tell us, sir, <laughs> about your monumental fuck-up. Uh, well, it, it couldn't have happened at a worse gig, either. It was... Um the uh, 12 12 12 concert, which was a benefit in New York at Madison Square Gardens for the victims of Hurricane Sandy. So, on the bill, we have um, Paul McCartney, uh, The Who, The Rolling Stones, um, Billy Joel, Bon Jovi, Bruce Springsteen, Eric Clapton, etc. Wow, and what a lineup! Playing. Oh, it's amazing. Amazing evening. Um, Alicia Keys. I should mention Alicia Keys because she's got the same birthday as me. Um, although she's obviously not watching, but um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. You never um, know. Hi, Alicia. <laughs> 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 so, um, and we haven't, uh, we've been asked to do this and we haven't done a gig for months. So it's like, okay, well, we, we had a rehearsal and it went okay. So 
Um, but Roger, being Roger, wants to get this done and out of the way as soon as possible. He doesn't want to be hanging around all night. So we're second on the bill. It's right after Bruce Springsteen. So what they've got is a circular stage, a revolving stage. And so the, on the front half, there's Bruce Springsteen, and he's performing. And we're set up on the other side. And so Bruce stops, play very much, off he goes. The stage starts turning to face the audience. And I can hear Billy Crystal talking, he's making his, doing his introductions and stuff. And at that point, I realized that I don't have my in-ears oh. and I don't have my pack. And I'm looking out at this audience and I just get this cold sweat. I really don't do this. Um, so I kind of call over one of the guys. Uh, I said, I haven't got my ears, I haven't got my pack. He said, where is it? I said, it's in the dressing room, I'm an idiot. Uh, so they went running, running down to get it. They come back with my ears. I said, I haven't got my pack. I need it. I still need the pack. So I went running off stage again. Billy Crystal's still talking, but I'm expecting any minute for them to go, da-da. <laughs> and I, I won't know what's going on because I haven't got a click in my ears. So I'm beginning to climb the walls here. And again, it's that similar feeling to the audition, except 20 times worse. Because there's, I think it went out to something like two billion people, and um, so they came running. Yeah, I mean, at the time, that's was a third of the population of the planet, um, and I was I was a bit nervous anyway, <laughs> to be fair. So the guy finally comes up. He's got this pack. I plug it in. It's not working. I still can't hear it. <laughs> so they run on. They got another pack. Plug it in. Put it in my back pocket. Switch the volume on. Okay, I'm fine. So now I've got to try, I've got all this adrenaline, which is just crazy amount of adrenaline. And um, it felt like about five seconds later we started the song. I've no idea how long, but it was just one of those really scary moments. And I know, I've, I've heard it back, the first solo that I played, the first bend was just like so sharp. Because I just had all this adrenaline. I was like, da 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 you know, like, whoa. <laughs> it sounded awful, um, but that was, you know, these. It, it could have been worse. It could have been much worse if they just started playing and I was just standing there like a lemon, going, "I don't know where I am." And not only that, but the, the brunettes that I use, they're so loud. So if I had to start playing, I wouldn't have been able to hear anything else anyway. Yeah, right. So that was probably the worst experience. Although it, you know, you look back on it because obviously it was broadcast, and I, I look back and I just. I just look like I'm on the beach, you know, just kind of calm. But yeah, inside I was just in pieces. That was just one of the worst experiences. Just so stupidly unprepared. Yeah. And it, but it could have been worse. It could have been much worse. And actually the end solo was okay. We did um, Comfortably Numb at the end and Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam came up and he did the, the, the vocals for that. So Nice. Um, and I can watch that. It's like, yeah, that was a, that was a nice moment. And um, I got so drunk as soon as we got off stage. Oh, yes, yeah, you would, yes. <laughs> Let me just, just forget about that. Down. That was just, yes. Yeah. But um, no, it was fine. Nobody noticed, apparently, apart from the rest of the band who were all in stitches. Wow. Uh, there was just me freaking out because I didn't have, uh, I, c I couldn't hear anything. But um, yes, not to, not to be repeated. Wow. That's, wow. that's the worst thing that's ever happened on stage, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. Not, See, not what you need. No, not in front of that many people live. <laughs> so, Dave, you, you mentioned your in ears. What are you listening to in your in ears? Yes. Um, jazz FM, usually. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, we have. Uh, we, <laughs> we have. Uh, because everything is. Um, to a click, everything's synced up with the visuals. So I have a click in my ears. Uh, there's some vocal cues, um, which I kind of don't need, but I, I just leave them there because if you start removing them, then 
then you start freaking out that oh wasn't wasn't there a vocal cue for that before? Um, so yeah, this is it's it's all on hard drive. Um, all the clicks and stuff are on hard drive. Um, cool. It's not the best thing to to have with the um, with in your ears because on the wall tour, especially, I was stood next to the drums, and sometimes the drums would play slightly behind the click because that feels really nice. Yep. So I'm going. Do a click, or do I play with the drums? If I play with the click, I'm going to be ahead, and that's just going to sound awful. Or do I just kind of go in the middle, so I'm still going to be ahead? Or do I, how do I get behind the drums with this click going in my my you know? So yeah, that was kind of an interesting learning experience, just trying to get used to feeling the music. And I I just ended up having the my ears so quiet. Everything on stage is so quiet. Um. And that just helped, I think. So I could actually hear acoustically the drums, and I could feel acoustically the um, my amp. Sure. And yep. I could just hear the click yep. in the background, and I just sort of played to that. Um, so that you mentioned... Much, I mean, everyone's got their own mixes. Everyone. Cool, cool. You mentioned vocal cues. Does that mean you've got like spoken word cues going on to let you know, you know, like verse two, three, four? Yes. Yep, yep. Cool. I've uh, experimented with sometimes, getting that together yeah, myself sometimes. for um, okay yeah I mean I don't as I said you don't need them but I just ended up keeping them because you know you just get used to it so um, I mean but, but things like the beginning of uh, Shine On for example um, where Snowy was playing the, the classic riff uh, there was a little count that would come in just before that. Riff, two, three, dun, 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 dun. You know, just yep. just because so much of that show was is based on the visuals. So, um, and it's just it works. It works incredibly well. Um, it's a little frustrating playing the click every night, <laughs> to be fair. But uh, you just kind of get used to it. I just treat it like a, a studio session, I guess. Cool. So if you've got uh, if you're playing to a click, are you no, are you just... putting in program changes for your 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 pedal boards to, to automatically change in time or anything like that? Uh, no, no, I did it all manually. I mean, I probably could have worked it out to um, to run a, a MIDI sync to the uh, to the hard drive to to change all, but then I'm not going to have much else to do. To be fair. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I kind of like having things to do, you know? Yeah. It, it keeps it. The, I, I kind of, if, if nothing's happening, if I'm not doing anything, then I'm probably going to start thinking about other stuff, and that's when you make mistakes or you forget to come in on something. So, yeah, if I've got stuff to do, I'm happy, really. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not like I can run around on stage like a lunatic like I used to with the, with previous bands. So, um, yeah, it's like, I, I can do this. Although saying that, it would have been handy to have that for the uh, when I played in the wheelchair for those night shows. Yes, <laughs> I still had to do all my program changes with uh, <laughs> Yes, with my foot that still, uh, you know, that was the fractured ankle one. So. Oh no. <laughs> oh. It's all. Yeah, it's all I, fun in games. I had a similar thing. You were talking about Perth earlier. Uh, I was playing in the Queen show, and I had a motorcycle yes. accident and messed up my foot it was only very minor uh and i went on tour the next day <laughs> went over to perth to do a run of shows and i had to i tried standing for some of it uh and had a stool there but trying to change patches luckily playing the brian may stuff he just uses pretty much one sound all night and, and rides the volume knob so um not too much tap dancing but i can totally relate with having a bung foot and trying to change your, your patches and that's no yes. fun yes no fun <laughs> now dave no, no i um with the because the fr yeah go on. I, I was gonna say i i did a quick little search for you on youtube and i was quite surprised to find some things of you um shredding i'm, I'm sure yeah you, that's not what you're known for in the roger waters group but you know you, you're quite the shredder and somebody in the, the chat just mentioned before that uh let me just go back here uh 
if anybody hasn't heard Dave Kilminster play, listen to his cover of For the Love of God. It is incredible. So uh, you've obviously got some chops. Uh, what type of players were you listening to to, to build up your, your chops? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've always worked on technique because I want to kind of blow the kind of things that I would hear in my head are not typical kind of Chuck Berry kind of guitar riffs. So, you know, from as, as young as I can remember, I would, I would work at classical pieces, um, and then I got into this, um, I think it was called Jazz Rock at the time. They probably term it as fusion nowadays, I'm not sure. But um, in the 70s, there was bands like uh, Bruford, um, UK with Alan Holdsworth, um, Coliseum 2 with Gary Moore. And a lot of that stuff was just, it was interesting, it was exciting. So that's kind of what got me into improving my technique in general. Um, but it probably wasn't until I went to see uh, Black Sabbath. And um, they had this American support band that I'd never heard of called Van Halen. And um, that really made me want to practice like a lot. I went out the next day, got the album, and just started trying, trying to work out what the hell was going on. Um, but it was a it was a kind of a gradual process. Um, later on, it was uh, Ingve. I was in a music shop in. They used to have this great music shop in in London called Shades, and every time I went in there, they'd be playing something kind of new, exciting. Um, you know, I went down there one 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 afternoon, and they were playing Racer X. You know, the band with Paul Gilbert. Mm -hmm. um, Next day, I'd go down and they were playing Ingve Malmsteen's new, uh, his, his first album. So I just started working all this stuff out. I, I, I was intrigued by techniques because I, th I thought the more techniques I had, the more I could actually play the music in my head. If that makes any any kind of sense. Yep. Yep. I didn't. I didn't want to just do one thing. I didn't want to just do sweet picking or just do tapping or whatever I, w I wanted to do everything and yep. I, I still do um i still practice every day and i still practice on different things i'm, I'm like a musical magpie um i just kind of hear something and i like, i want to do that how does that how, how do we do that so um, i'll sit down and figure it out and whatever it is whether it's bottleneck whether it's country playing whether it's some bebop solo it's just um to me it's just all music so um and I've got pretty good ears, so I can transcribe most things. So, um, yeah, I just... Um, and also the other thing I used to do was to work... Um, for example, if there was a, a phrase that I was playing where I was starting on a downstroke, I'd say, OK, well, let's see if I can start on an upstroke. Because I figured you'd only be as good as your weakest stroke. Yep. So I started doing crazy things like that, or... You know, if I was playing something with the first, second, and third fingers, I'd swap them around and maybe second, third, and fourth fingers. You know, it was just um, I would I would challenge myself. I challenge myself every day on on the on the instrument. It's just uh, it keeps me sane in a, in a weird way. Yeah, yeah. I totally relate, mate. I I get up and that's the yeah, first thing I so do I, I when I have so. my morning coffee is pick up and have a bit of a, a practice. So it's nice to hear how other people practice. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah now, I, I, I don't really have any regime as such, but uh, it's all right, go on. I was going to say there is a question here again. from Nigel again. Noons again. who says, yeah, actually you are starting to, to glitch out a bit on me again. Is it time for a, a quick log out and log in? Sure. Let yeah, me. yeah. Oh, look at that. Now you're seeing my webcam. It's two of me. It's two of me. Nigel, I'm getting to your question right now. Here's Dave. Here's Dave. That's better. Now I can see you. Hello. 
Nigel Noons says, <laughs> Dave Slegato. Yeah. It's so much better when you're actually moving and I can see you there. Uh, Dave Slegato, left-hand facility is incredible. I'd really appreciate it if you could ask how Dave developed strength and finger independence slash timing with this with that technique. Ooh. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, yeah. My work at the moment so I don't know if I could show you I could try hmm you think about this I was a huge Holdsworth fan so um, I miss who you said I, I, I was intrigued a huge Holdsworth fan Holdsworth okay yep yes so I was kind of intrigued by the possibilities of four notes on a string so I basically I worked it out mathematically that if you've got four notes on a string and you want to play them in it in any kind of order you there's 24 different possibilities for four notes without repeating so in other words you could play oh, i guess i could do this um do, 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 do. so I try and play some kind of musical scale i, I don't like I have a pet hate against this, um, you know, this warm up that um, a lot of people do. The, uh, the um, you know, that thing. It's just horrible. It's just it's musically pointless. Nobody wants to hear you do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So what I would do is I would take a scale like. Um, And I okay. So that would be one, two, three, four. So then I would go one, two, four, three. And it's just one hit, just one pick for each string. So the rest is rest is lotto. So once you do that, then you've got one, three, two, four. One, three, four, two. Uh, one, four, two, three. And one, four, three, two. So that's the first six. And then you get another six starting on the second finger. So then you go two, one, three, four. Wow. You know, it's, it's a long... So once you've done the 24 variations with each finger, then that's your kind of warm-up. You're, you're warmed up and ready to go for any kind of legato things yeah, that you, yeah, might, yeah. Uh, you might come across. So yeah. that, that for me, that was, that was great. And it was also vaguely musical because you could kind of take ideas. And you could work out your own things. Um, I ended up liking... That one, one, two, one, two, three, four. In fact, let's have them three instead. I'm not sure how much you, of this you can hear, sorry. But, um, it, 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 just in the background, but I'm getting the basic concept of what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. And it's much better than going... That, which is utterly pointless and non-musical and you, no one's going to pay you to play that. So. Well, that's um, funny you should say that because <laughs> that's usually the first thing I, I do to warm up and I've come to realise that, yeah, oh, that's, it? yeah. No. One, two, three, no. four, one, two, three, four. <laughs> no. No. Don't no. do it. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like... Uh, doesn't it's non-musical garbage yeah no no other musical instruments does that yeah i do notice no. that when i try and throw in lines based around that everyone looks at me and the first thing they go is oh you quoted from flight of the bumblebee <laughs> so yes that's the first thing people yes. think of when you when you play a chromatic sure, passage yeah yeah. yeah yeah yes yeah and i mean uh i mean there's other ways of doing it you could you know, if you want to do four notes on a string, 
there's there's kind of more musical ways. I guess you could take something like um, let me see. Uh, um, okay, G7 arpeggio. And then just fill in the gaps with the rest of the fingers. That's quite nice. Because then you get to you get to exercise, you get to move your hand around. And yep. if someone happens to be playing a G seven chord, you've got some you've got some things that you can play that actually sound vaguely musical. So um, yeah, that's that's what I would do. I, I would highly recommend no one doing that exercise ever again because it's just. I've been told. I can't think of any musical instrument. There's violinists, saxophonists, piano players. Nobody does that kind of thing. Nobody mm. does kind of mm. shapes, non-musical garbage. But that's because they've been around longer, I guess, and there's more. Sure, more, sure. More um, practice stuff, I guess. So. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of how I worked out the, the as, as how I developed the legato anyway, I guess. Because once you do that exercise, then everything else after that is easy because you've done everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. That's a lot of combinations. So I'd, I'd get lost going, oh, geez, where, where am I up to with that one? But uh, how about picks, Dave? Do you find a uh, different style of picks, heavy, light picks, effects uh, when you go for more of a, a shred type of approach? Um, I've been using this same pick um, forever, which is a two millimeter Dunlop. Um, if you can see, it's actually uh, it's got my name on it. Nice. So yeah, it makes me very happy. Um, I've been using these forever. They last forever. They're two mil um, Dunlop Tortex picks. Um, so they there's really good grip on them. Uh, and you could do, you could kind of do anything on them, really. They don't wear out very quickly at all. I've, pr I've probably been using this one for about two years, and it's still, <laughs> still nice, as good as new, really. Yeah. I, I tend to be, I tend to pick very parallel to the string. I don't do the angle thing. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't really like the sound, especially when you use a heavy pick. You can really hear it. It sounds like a a gerbil trying to get out of a cage or something. It's just got that scratchy thing. It's just, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, the two mil Dunlop picks are fabulous. I used to use metal picks, which were Oh, really? Well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of miss those, actually. Um, That'd give a nice little chirp to the front end of the note. Yeah. Much yeah, like Brian exactly. May again. Like, cause if, when you listen exactly. to Brian using the coin, the start of every yeah. note is this... Choo -choo. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful sound. It's it's probably the most um, most recognisable guitar sound. I would argue it's the most record recognisable electric guitar sound ever. Mm. You can all tell yep. when it's Brian. I, I can't think of anyone else that's uh, um, that's up there really. And he's so down on his playing. Just all the good ones like, are. Kind of, yeah, it just makes me want to shake him around. But he's just come on, man. You've, you know the contribute uh, contributions to music are just immense. Yeah, it's the most uh, unique guitar sound ever. Um, I mean, you know, as I said, I'm a huge Green fan. The first five albums for me was uh, uh, it's kind of the blueprint for everything that I've done ever since, I guess. Wow. Um, yeah, because it was um, people that have not really heard them. You know, they'll probably say, oh, yeah, Radio Gaga and stuff like that. So, no, <laughs> really, you need to go back. Yeah. You need to hear Queen 2. You need to hear Cheer Heart Attack. You need to hear Ogre Battle. Or you need to hear these prog epics. And, you know, it was just uh, amazing stuff, really, really amazing. <laughs> nice, nice. I've had a question coming up here, and you mentioned uh, playing acoustic guitars with, with Roger. Any acoustic mm -hmm. guitars that, that you have a preference for? Mm, that's a good question. I I have a um, two <coughs> excuse me. I have two Martins on tour with me, a uh, six and a twelve string. Um, I don't spend a lot of time playing acoustic guitar anymore. Um, although I remember when Stephen uh, when I talked with Stephen Wilson, he had a really nice guitar, acoustic. 
They didn't give me one though, so I didn't use it. Um, I'm trying to think what the, na what the name of the company was now. They had a really unusual um, tailpiece where the six strings, instead of being all in, in one place, they kind of fanned out. Oh, nice. Yeah. And they were really nice, but they felt nice. I, tr I tried tried it in, in Soundcheck once, and it just felt very comfortable, and it sounded great. Because I've, I've done a solo acoustic shows before, and I've, 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 it's, you know, I know most people that do that, they have some, sort of three pickups on their acoustics, and it's, uh, you know, so if I do any more of that in the future, I'm probably going to have to... Uh, do some more investigating, really. Yeah. But the Martins are fine. The Martins are great. They they um they seem to um, get better with age actually. Because when I bought them, they sounded they sounded okay. But the more the more you play, them, just um, I don't know whether it's the vibrations or um, but they they do get better. I've heard theories yeah. about that with acoustic guitars that, uh, and electric guitars that just the vibration of the strings somehow realigns the molecules mm -hmm. in the wood and it just sounds better. I don't know what voodoo goes yeah. on there, but I've got a friend that's got a, no. a beautiful Taylor Koa big-bodied thing and I've had a bit of an acoustic guitar shootout here and that just has an extra octave of frequencies down low that no other guitar <laughs> has. Um, right. Not notes, but frequencies. People say, "Oh, yeah, yeah. but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying." Um, yes. And uh, he swears that's just getting better and better and more low end as time progresses. Mm -hmm. He's had that yeah. for you know, a good ten, fifteen years. So um, there is something that goes on with them. Yeah, I think I had my uh, pains. Um, the, the six strings on OM28. Um, I did get a bigger one as well, but I don't know. I'm, I'm quite small bodied, so, you know, for the same reason as I like a Telecaster rather than a Strat, I tend to prefer the feel of a, of a smaller body acoustic. So. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, you have the I've fingers of you have the stuff. fingers of a tall man. I just as you were playing, you, you said you, you're smaller stature, but you have the, the I, long skinny fingers, don't you? Well, I, I guess. Um, I've worked on my stretch, though. Um, I don't know if you can see this. If uh, you've actually, the vision's got, frozen uh, up on me, so I can't actually see you again. It might be time for a, a reset <laughs> once again. Do you want to do a quick one, and then we'll just see Let if we can that see now. that stretch? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks for sticking in there, folks. This happens, but I'm still getting a lot out of it, so it seems the log out and log in back in trick seems to oh here he is with vision yes uh -huh. that's better now now We're we can back. see that freaky freaky stretch well it's not i wouldn't say it's freaky but again this was probably alan holsworth's fault um me trying to play some of his crazy accords so um and if you can see on the on the left hand yeah it is a it's kind of a much bigger stretch than on the right hand. wow <laughs> but that was just it's, you know, three years of um, trying to play uh, IOU tunes um, from one of the first uh, Alan Holsworth albums. It was just, uh, and it's so frustrating because the chords themselves, you know, you could get something like, um, um, mm. wow, That's look at that. Place. Um, but on a piano, that's the easiest thing in the world because all the notes are really close together. Yeah. <laughs> but on guitar, obviously, because of the tuning, you have to do these ridiculous stretches. So, yeah. You know, I, I kind of gave up playing house with stuff. It's too depressing. I've never even <laughs> attempted it. You, you probably would have seen me off camera there. I, I was sitting there going, doing the whole stretch thing and. I did, I yes. That, yeah. So, I mean, it's only slight with mine, but I... know it's only bit, yeah. It's only... Yeah, yeah, little, yeah. I'll just go across there, so... Yeah, but... Yeah, sure, wow. Yeah. yeah. I never noticed. I'm only... Yeah, that's... It's only another centimetre or so, but... I'd never, never tried that. And I guess... Yeah. yeah that would what happen from doing those... 
status quo or whatever. <laughs> do you do you have like a, a, exactly. a guilty pleasure of you know a band like Status Quo that's nice and not easy, but that you like to to play that isn't as challenging? For me, it's ACDC. I right. Well, of course, of course. Um, in fact, when I was in Fremantle, I. I Went to visit the uh, the Bon Scott statue. Yes. Uh, yes. In fact, I got to meet him. I got to meet him and uh, Angst um, many, many years ago. Wow. Uh, when, when ACDC played in Bristol. But, um, yeah, it's actually, ACDC tunes are just so much fun to play. You're completely right. I, I've played in various covers bands. And um, it's, for me, it's... it's uh, I get as much enjoyment playing, you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit as I would playing one of um, Paganini's Caprices. It's just, to me, it's exactly the same. It's yeah. Just, it's music and it's fun. So, um, But yeah, I've, I've done a lot of covers. <laughs> and there's a certain attitude in some of that music that's, that's hard to come across. I, I say um, a guilty pleasure of something being easier to play. I guess I grew up playing the hard rock styles and Malcolm Young for me is a huge influence on my rhythm playing, which is let's face it 90% of the gig, but not everyone can do it. Not everybody can do it. What, what I think is easy. I hear other guys, especially guys who play more jazz or country and they go, Oh yeah, ACDC. And I sit there listening out. Oh, the, the, the attitude's not there. Uh, it's, it'd be the same as me trying to fake, trying to play country music or jazz which i most definitely cannot mm. uh and i was always down on that for a long time going man i hear these guys but then i realized they can't play that Auss- aussie pub rock style you know acdc yeah. etc the way i can so there's this a certain uh attitude behind different styles that you have to grow up loving that music to appreciate those those nuances huh Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I I am a rocker. It's, I've you know I've, I've tried playing lots of different styles. My first ever um, solo album was on classical guitar. Actually. Really? But essentially, I'm um, yeah. Essentially, I'm just I just love rock music. So yep. I love hitting things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's not not something that everyone can do. It's uh, it's um, it's definitely an attitude. Um, in fact, it reminds me of when I used to teach. You probably don't know that as well. I used to teach many years ago, um, and, and uh, this guy. Came, this would have been early nineties, and this uh, student came in one day, and he's just bought this. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan signature model Strat. I think it's just come out. Okay, so he's got the Strat. He's he's got this fancy strap. He's got a cowboy hat, and he brings it into me for a private lesson one day. And he said, "Oh, I wanted you to have a look at this because I'm, you know, I think there's uh, I think there's something wrong with it. I might, it might be the pickups, but it's not really sounding like Stevie Ray." And I'm like, "Okay, well." Let's have a look. So he plugs it in. And he plays this. Just put it up there. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Um, let me just try it a sec. Yeah. I said, yeah, I think it's the pickups. <laughs> <laughs> Just handed it back. It, and uh, I, yeah, I think he appreciated my sarcasm. But, um, you know, you, if, if you want to play rock, you have to hit it. And that's why I use tens, and that's why I use a two millimeter pick, because I'm quite heavy handed with, with playing in general. Because um, you, you, you know, it's a physics thing. You get out what you put in. So, yeah. Um, 
I definitely hear you on the heavier pick. Um, for years, I used Jim Dunlop riffs, so are called, uh, and they were these fluorescent green things that were maybe nice. a point eight millimeter or something like, like that. I went for the bright green because if I dropped that on a black stage, I, I could find it, uh, and I got used to it. And then I was at Nam few years back and i was walking along and i bumped into andy james do you know andy the english shred oh, yeah, yeah. shred guy yep. yeah, yeah and i stopped and i was like andy man you're one of the fastest cleanest pickers i've ever heard in my life that's amazing and um he's he's looked at me he goes i have a secret and he pulled it put his hand in his pocket he pulled out his new signature pick and he gave me one of those and it was two or three mil, no flex in it whatsoever. And I mm. took that home and tried practicing with that. And then all of a sudden I was picking faster and I realized that it's all about using a, a heavier pick without the flex. And ever yes. since then, I've been using these big chunky chicken pick things. So I'll try and hold one up. If I hide my face, it might focus on it. i try and get my face out of the shot. Focus. Focus. Modern technology. Isn't it wonderful? Anyway, you have to take my word for it. They're very big and chunky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really do think it makes a, a huge difference. Oh, the um, way that the, the notes explode when I use one of these is just amazing. And I had uh, Bob Spencer on about a year ago. And Bob plays for Roast Tattoo and another great Aussie band, The Angels, etc. Mm -hmm. And he brought up using exactly the same pick and just how it changed his whole tone and how it explodes. And like you said about your pick, you've been using that same one for about two years now, that same here. I, I just don't wear these ones out as opposed to some of the other uh, thinner ones that I do one pick mm. scrape and pff, it, it's gone. So yeah, the heavy pick. But you said you don't yeah. worry about pick angle. Now I had Troy Grady on. I'm not sure if you've seen the Cracking the Code series on YouTube before. I'm, I'm aware of him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's all yeah. about pick angle and how, you know, depending on how many string notes per string you're playing in a particular run di dictates the angle that you have the pick on and all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah. he's really broken mm. that down. Yes. But it's yes. not something you've thought about I too much. I not to not to that extent. Um, I've actually been working on the two things I've been working on most in the last six months, probably are picking and uh, vibrato. So, um, but I I find that I can I can do things. I think I saw some of. Troy stuff before and he said oh yeah and then, and then you come across this thing and you can't do this upstroke here and I'm like well I can <laughs> it seems quite, quite quite natural but uh, um, you know as I said I've worked on on playing things back to front and upside down and, and just um, so that whatever kind of picking sequence I come, come across I can kind of I can cope with it yep or well, my right hand can cope with it yep so um and I, yeah, I, I, t I tend to keep it flat to the string, to parallel to the string. Um, and I just, yeah, as I said, I don't, I don't know if you've tried, because you, some people pick with the side, the edge of the pick. Um, and I don't know if you've tried that with a heavy pick, but it just, you get all this extra scraping noise, which doesn't, um, doesn't help. Yeah, right, yep. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I like these. This works. This, this does everything I want it to do. I can still do. Um, I can do funky stuff with it. I can, you know, it works on classical. It just, it's just, it's just the perfect pick for me. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to keep it straight. And uh, the only thing I've been experimenting with recently is, is kind of trying to pick from the wrist, just to see if that makes much difference. Because I tend to pick from the forearm. Um, the jury's still out. I'm sitting. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm. You know, you know what it's like. Learning guitar is just an endless journey. Never ending. Never ending. The more it's one of those things. The more yeah. you learn, the more you realise what you don't know. 
Uh, and, and that yes, goes back exactly. to what you're saying about Brian May being down on his own playing. I guess it's because he, mm. the more he learns, the more he realizes that what he doesn't know. Is there, there are certain things that you wish you, you had a better going. grasp on? Is there things you, you wish you had a better grasp on when it comes to playing? Like, what don't you like about your own playing? Uh, um, oh. Wow. What don't I like? I wish I'd have spent more time playing rhythm when I was younger. Yep. Um, Because there's certain players that play and they just have a groove about every single thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I don't feel like I have that. And it's not, um, you know, it's actually on my list of things to work on. Just generally getting a better I mean especially when I used to do the acoustic um, solo acoustic shows you know it's just you it's just the guitar and you have to keep time and, and as well as add all the harmonic interest and sing and um, that's one of the things I love about Tommy Emmanuel when oh. he plays because that's just ridiculous uh, but he's got such a great groove about his, his acoustic playing. It, it just makes you want to dance. There's a, there's a lot of other guys that do the fancy tapping and slapping and, and stuff. But I usually find the timing is just a little a little wayward. But with yep. Tommy, it's just well, just rock solid. So um, if there's something I'd like to improve on, it's probably that right now. Um, but I don't get to do it. And most people don't practice that kind of thing. People don't practice rhythm. You yeah. Know, you spent 95% of your life on the stage playing rhythm, and you spent like less than a 1% actually practicing it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird. Yep. You know, I, I know of some guys who absolutely run rings around me when it comes to their, their trick bag, as I'd like to say, you know, just all the flashy stuff, but then. When it comes down to just playing the rest of the song, there's just something missing because they haven't put much time into that. They've put all the time into getting that shred mm. thing together. So it is very overlooked. Yeah. 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 You seem to have frozen up on yeah, me again. The timing is, is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Let me hang out. Hang on. Okay. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. We come up with a bit of a system. It only takes 10 seconds and he's back when I can see him moving. Let's see. There he is. There he was. There he is. Got him back. <laughs> and I'm back. Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, it's, it's weird, actually. I, I, was, uh, I remember when I was recording uh, guitar tracks for my album that I'm still working on. And the hardest one that I had to do was this. I, I wrote this reggae track. I don't know why, but I just came up with this reggae track, which I love. And that was probably the hardest one to play, to to get it just to groove, because it's yep. all about consistency. It's all about getting the, the right place in the in the bar to hit these little. Da, 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 you know, you don't want the on the beat. You want it maybe slightly behind the beat, but you want it consistently behind the beat. And if it's a kind of a slow tune, it's it's a nightmare to try and just make that groove. So. Um, yeah. If if I if I had my time again, I would I would work on rhythm more as a kid. Yep, yep. I see, it's not that I can't do it. It's just it, it's not as natural as I would like it to be in my playing. Yeah, right. So, yep. Um, so, Dave, you, you mentioned Tommy Emmanuel before, mm. and um, actually, when I did have a bit of a, a look around online, I saw that you won a, a guitar competition. Uh, years ago, I I won one myself recent, uh, not recently, years ago on the Gold Coast here, and a year later I had to have a photo shoot with Tommy Emmanuel, and Tommy yeah. opens up his guitar case and hands me his guitar and goes have a play, and I just looked at him and I was just like, I'm not fucking playing anything in front of Tommy Emmanuel. I just cannot play that finger style guitar at all. What am I gonna do? Yeah, some re rehearsed arpeggio. Uh -huh shred thing on on an acoustic guitar and i felt quite silly have you ever had to play in front of anybody that you've just gone 
oh my god, I'm playing in front of blah blah blah. Um, I've played in front of Tommy Emmanuel, which is very scary. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there was a yes, there was a time uh, a few years ago. Uh, I was playing with Guthrie Govan, who I, who I guess you must know. Yep. Um, and we used to go to Italy a lot to do um, to do these shows. It was a four piece. He play stuff from his album and you know some fusion classics or whatever. So anyway, we end up we end up this tour somewhere, and the next night there's a there's a show with Tommy Emmanuel. So both Guthrie and I decide we're going to stay on and watch the show. Now, around about this time, there's a volcano that goes off <laughs> in Italy. And the support band that was going to show up, they do turn up because all the flights were cancelled. So Guthrie and I, Lee, I must confess, that we would play a support set for, for time with just the two electric and we do some of the tricks we play um, on the tour and he loved us and so we came back a couple of months later with two acoustics and um, we did a sport for him and at the end of, of every show he'd, he'd get us back on and so the three of us would just play um, oh what's that th- I can't remember the name of the tune it was a tune by John McLaughlin, Audi Neal, and Pac de Lucia. Off, probably off Friday night in San Francisco. Um, so we sort of jam around with, with stuff like that. And I'm sat in the middle, and there's Tommy Emmanuel, who's probably the best acoustic guitarist ever. Absolutely. On one side. And there's Guthrie Govan, who's probably the, the greatest guitar, electric guitarist ever on the other side. And I'm just in the middle going, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I here? Am I just? I'm just going to play chords. I'm happy, you know. But um, yeah, that was kind of scary, really. Um, I'm trying to think of some. I, I know I've been with with Roger. Sometimes I'll be in the office and I'll be reading off the guest list for that night, and it's like, oh yeah, Jack Nicholson's coming tonight, and don't so and that. And I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know who's <laughs> in the audience. Until yeah, after, right. Yes. Yeah. It just freaks me out. Better off not knowing or seeing yeah, them, huh? Yeah, I, d- I don't. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, I, d- I can't think of... Yeah, I think the Clapton came to a gig. In fact, I, probably the worst one. I know the v- Yes, I know the very worst one. In yep. fact, it was on the wall tour. It would have been about 2012. And um, David Gilmore had agreed to come along and play Comfortably Numb. So, but the night before, he came along to watch the show. So David Gilmore was in the audience, and of course I'm stood there playing all his stuff. I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is kind of surreal. You know, this is... Uh, um, but apparently he enjoyed the show, and then he came, came the next night, and he, he made his special surprise guest appearance. Um, He's always been really nice to me, so um, nice. yeah, he's a lovely chap. Nice. And did he use your gear when he yeah. did the guest? No, God, no. No, no, he brought his special strap, his, um, the Jimi Hendrix guitar strap that I think his wife bought him. Um, and he, no, he had all his rig with him, all the, all the stuff. I think he had two guitar techs, in fact, with him. Wow. Um, yeah, and it was the bit... Where it. Um, because on the wall tour, I don't know if you saw it, but for Comfortably Numb solo, I had to stand on top of the wall, which is about 40 feet up in the air. On cool. This, the wobbly platform, which is just, oh, it's not cool, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it was just really hated it. It was just this wobbly platform that was kind of a, um, like a cherry picker type thing. So, um, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't fun at all. I was always happy when I played the last note. And, the cherry pick would slowly do that, and I was like, okay, back to earth. Um, but yeah, so David got up and, and did that as well on the, on the 
on the lift and um, I think he hated it actually <laughs> he really didn't enjoy going up there it's, it's um, I don't know what it is it's just something I like to be on terra firma when I'm playing yeah you know I'm not a big fan of heights um, but uh, yeah so that was that was probably the the one where I felt a little nervous I could tell with the crew as well the the crew before the show where, when David was watching, they were all sort of, you right, Dave? Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. Just check in just to make sure I was okay. You know, but, um, I was wondering yeah. with, if you ever had to play in front of Dave. So, um, yeah, now you answered yes. that question. Wow, yes. that, that, that would be very daunting. That would be very daunting. Just like, I'm playing these iconic solos. I have no idea if you And there he is. I, I've, yes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether he liked it. I have no idea. We, we're from a different background, you know. As I said, I'm a rocker, so I tend to play things a bit more, a bit heavier. I tend to hit things a bit harder, and he's more from the, the blue side of things, I guess. So I don't know how much he appreciated it, but uh, he was very kind to me afterwards. So. That's nice. That's nice. Folks, yeah. I'm yeah. going to go through some of the questions so if you've got any questions that you want to ask dave now's the time to drop them in the chat room uh have i already answered the ones okay somebody was asking about whether you've tried the frank gambali tuning now i've had frank on and i didn't know he tuned any differently do you know anything about that um i thought it was standard as well yeah yeah I mean, he plays a lot of fourths, you know, sweet picking, but... Uh, yeah. There, I had there is a um, kind of a fourth tuning, which, um, in fact, your guest... Tom Quayle. Uh, Tom Quayle on the yeah. other day. Yep. Yes, he, he uses that fourth, fourth tuning. Yeah, we went into great and, detail. Um, I'm wondering Alex whether... Hutchins, I believe, as well. Yep. I'm just wondering whether yeah. they, they might have had them yeah. confused. As far as I know... Right, maybe... Um, I, I yes, I've no idea. I haven't heard anything from Frank since ooh, Truth in Shredding. Yeah, right. Which was a compilation album when he played some tracks with uh, with Alan. Um, yes, no idea. Yeah, no, I've had I've had Frank on, and I don't recall him saying anything about an alternate tuning. So, um, that, and I actually sure. put I, a I little. Mean, I, I, I know. I was just going to say, I did I mean, my last album that I did. Um, which was called The Truth. I came up with a, a, diff a completely different tuning and I wrote all the songs in that tuning. Um, so that was that was kind of fun. I, it was my idea to try and um, approach the guitar like, a, like a, a kid again that didn't actually know how to play so that I would just use my ears. So I just came up with this bizarre tuning uh, which was something like, God, I can't remember, C, G, D, G, A, D, I think it was, from low to high. And I just wrote, it, it was kind of fun because I didn't, you know, I, I found this tuning, I didn't know that, how to play, I couldn't play, a, uh, you know, I couldn't play a D chord. I had no idea, I couldn't play a major scale, but I'd start moving my fingers around and i come up with this thing. I just found it so inspiring. So I wrote the whole album based around that. Um, nice. That tuning. Yeah. So I've kind of messed around with tunings a bit, but not. Uh, I've never. I've never tried the fourth thing. Mm hmm. It does open up a whole new sound, doesn't it? When you you tune the guitar a bit different, and and you're putting mm. your fingers in places where normally you would know what it sounds like to go there, but you discover some very nice yes. happy accidents, right? Yes, exactly. Mm, mm. I, re I remember spending ages when I was a kid working out the Rain Song by Led Zeppelin. And um, I thought, God, this guy's a genius because I was, I was working it out in standard tuning and it was really, really difficult. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you find out it's in some, you know, in an open tuning and you can play it with two fingers. It's like, oh, okay. But uh, yeah, no, it's... it's, it's um, Life's too short, unfortunately. I'd love to try all this stuff, but uh, yeah, if, if you ever get bored, um, alternate tuning is definitely a, a good thing to do. 
to, to write stuff. The, the only problem is if I go out and try and play any of that stuff live now, I'm going to need like three guitars at least to, uh, you know. And I, di I didn't try soloing in that tuning either. I kind of got to do it a little bit, but it's still... Yeah, I'd struggle with standard tuning, to be honest. So. so, speaking of multiple guitars, how many guitars do you take out on the road with you? Um, hmm. I've got the two acoustics, as I said, six string and a 12 string. Um, we need the 12 string for a welcome to the machine because that's just really cool. Um, there's a weird tuning for dogs, so I need a special guitar for that. And maybe two other electrics that are both standards, um, just in case I have a problem with one and I can swap it over. Really. So, um, yeah, say five electrics and two acoustics for the last tour. Yeah. Um, the wall tour was, was, was even more because um, I had to play a and and um, high strung guitar as well for the beginning of Hey You. Um, which is kind of like um, Nashville tuning. So like but, the um, higher strings off a 12 string? Yes, is, exactly. Yep. yep. Exactly that, yeah. Yeah. That's um, an interesting that's, that's thing. Hey you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. I, I've used yeah, that before so. for overdubs when I've been recording. I used to have a, a guitar just in Nashville tuning. That's what they call it, isn't it? Nashville yes. tuning. Yep. And, yes, I think it is, yeah. And just adding that extra guitar was... Um, like a 12 string kicking in but it wasn't a 12 string it just added that extra layer yes. i loved it loved yeah, it yeah 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 so i've no idea how many on i had on the wall tools uh, maybe but uh, there's speaking, a lot of stuff to do eh? speaking of the wall wall tour uh ws says dave how was it to play the series of shows in ziggo dome i was at the first night and i wonder what it was like for you the last time was Last time was Arena with the Wall, I think. Did you catch, catch all that? <laughs> how was it? How was it to play I the did. series of shows at Ziggo um, Dome? Um, do you recall playing the Ziggo Dome? I do, I do, because I uh, we recorded our um, we recorded the um, the Wall live. I think that was recorded there. Okay. Or a lot, at least a lot of the visuals were recorded there. Mate, while your picture's good, show, um, show us you that great little uh, microphone stand you're using right now again. Oh, this is so sad. I'm so sorry. Um, it's a wall shoe box. <laughs> that is cool. Wall shoe box. <laughs> because I don't have a mic stand. This is very sad. Um... I do recall that it was. It was. Uh, I mean, it's always stressful recording a live show. Um, we actually did one show where there was no audience at all, and we just played as if there was an audience, but oh, cool. there was cameramen on, yep. actually on stage, so they could kind of get the close-ups. So yeah, I do remember it very clearly. Um, the only problem with uh, with the in ears, especially, is it's almost like you're in your own little world. So. You know, people say, oh, what does it sound like in this venue or that venue? Like, everything sounds the same. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because everything's close mic and everything goes into my in ears. Yeah. And it really doesn't um, doesn't change that much from, from one venue to another. And do um, you have microphones picking up uh, the crowd ambience being fed into your in ears as well? No. No. So that's no. pretty, I mean, they, pretty they dry did. then. It is very dry. And I, I kind of prefer it like that. Um, I was a bit annoyed, actually, I, when I saw the, uh, the video for Us and Them, um, and I heard my acoustic guitar sound for uh, Wish You Were Here. Now, live, it's, um, I, I have it completely dry, but you're in arena with 30,000 people, and it sounds gorgeous, and you can hear every single... Every single note, but it's just got this beautiful reverb. And of course, I, I, I watched the film, and it's just, it's just the DI sound, and it sounds awful. Ah, oh. I'm like, oh, thank, thanks, guys. Um, you know, they, there was audience mics, but I guess they just didn't use that much of them. In fact, I didn't really hear any of them. Yeah, it just, you know, um, which was kind of a shame, really. 
So you're adding uh, ambience to your monitors that isn't going through front of house? No, I just I just have it so quiet that I can hear it. You know, in, in quiet places like uh, quiet passages, like the the beginning of uh, "Wish You Were Here," I can actually hear it in the room, and it's just gorgeous. You know, I, I don't like I I don't add lots of delays or I don't think I use any reverb at all on on any of the the electric guitar sounds because. You're playing in a giant craft hanger. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So what's what's the point, you know? So I just I like just hearing the the, the natural sound in the room. So I, I keep my electric guitars and the acoustics just as dry as possible and you know, the room adds the uh, the ambience. Nice. Um that seems to work anyway. I you know, I I've, I've heard some guitarists and they use a delay on stage and then you delay and then it goes into this huge cavernous reverb it's like, I, just, I, I can see your fingers moving but I can't hear yeah I can't hear what you're playing so yeah I just try and keep it as, as loud and straight and as possible you know somebody wants to know what the favorite venue you've ever played at is do you does anything spring to mind Ooh. the Albert Hall sprung to mind immediately although nice. I've never actually played that with Roger but um, I played that with Stephen a couple of times. Um, that's a beautiful venue. Um, I guess I love the old-fashioned ones. You know, it's just... Um, well, there's um, a lot of history in a place like the, they, the, they the Albert Hall. Sound, but yes. Yeah, I, I loved playing the Albert Hall with Stephen. Um, with Roger, probably my favourite would have been Wembley Stadium. Um, we played Wembley Stadium on, on the World Tour. Um, I mean, it's partly the history, partly my a lot of my family were there, and I felt like it was a really good night. Um, nice. So I, I have sort of really nice memories of that. Um, I mean, in general, I prefer smaller venues, just so you can actually see the audience there. Because, uh, you know, some of these big shows... We, we played here in Mexico um, a few years ago in, in Zocalo Square, and there was... Um, I forget how many people there were. Um, something like three quarters of a million people here, or something. And you're just looking out, and it feels so surreal. Yeah, disconnected. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I mean, it was lovely, you know. But I'm standing on top of this wall, and I'm looking out, and I'm seeing all the lights, and stuff, and it kind of fades into the the sky with the stars, and it's just it feels very, very surreal. But, you know, you play a, a venue in front of two or three hundred people and you can actually see them and you can feel feel the energy. It's kind of uh, So a lot of the shows that I played with Stephen, Stephen Wilson, were, were kind of more like that. That was a lot of fun. So um, you've mentioned Stephen Wilson a few times. Um, is he yeah. a, a known artist in, in the UK? I, I don't know him myself. Yes. Is it? Yep, yep. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, he is. Yeah, he's he used to be in a band called Porcupine Tree. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. And in fact, I think Porcupine Tree was essentially his band, and then he decided that he wanted to branch out and do his own solo stuff. So sure. Um, and it's amazing music, actually. The um, the album. I can't believe I'm plugging Stephen. He doesn't plug me, but. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the album that he recorded a few years ago with actually Guthrie playing guitar, uh, Michael Miniman on drums, um, it's called the, Ra the Raven That Refused to Sing, and it's probably, well it's definitely one of my favourite albums of the last 20 years, um, and that was, that was actually before I joined, so I kind of... Um, Guthrie and Marco left to do their aristocrats and uh, I went to replace and um, it was just such fun to play play his material. His, his, I love his music. Um, nice. Again, it's kind of, it's a little heavier, so, or at least the music at the time was heavier. He's, he's kind of gone a little more pop mainstream recently, but um, I don't know. He's just got such a huge 
um, backlog, backlog. Sorry, back catalog of uh, of incredible albums, incredible tunes. So um, yeah, he's he's definitely worth checking out if you haven't, um, which you obviously haven't. So. No, no, I have to <laughs> I have to check it check him out. Um, I have heard of Porcupine Tree, and you know that they yes. were a a big deal. Um, but again, I haven't heard right. them. But um, some new music that I can check out now. Dave, I recommend it definitely. There is a question here. I'm not sure what they're referring yes. to. Maybe you might know. How did you feel in Brazil? It was a very embarrassing situation, I think. Ah. <laughs> Do you know what? Now that that's a that's a I South know American, exactly what that's about. Yes. That's a, a very South American yes. name. Uh, by the, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, but they may be from Brazil themselves. So, is that something you want to uh, share with us? I, I'm happy to. Um, Roger is um, what's what's a good way of putting this? Involved in politics. Okay. And um, so, and he makes his opinions known throughout the shows that we play. And in Brazil. Um, they were just coming up to the elections, and um, without getting too deeply into it, um, Roger put this thing up on the screen, just saying you really don't want to vote for this guy. And half the audience cheered, and half of them booed. Um, someone threw a glass of ice at me, hit my foot. Um, there was fights breaking out in the stadium. And um, in fact, people were still fighting as we were leaving. I, believe. I didn't actually see any of this because um, I didn't have my glasses on. I can, oh. I've, I've got a good close vision, but sort of further out, it's, it becomes a bit of a blur. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, I don't know. I mean, Roger's always been sort of outspoken politically with his, with his views, so... And in some places it goes down great, and some places we get booed. And he doesn't really care because he's just going to be Roger and do his thing. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, I I'd, I'd, I'd still love, I'm still more than happy to go back and play in Brazil, obviously. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you stop playing places where you don't believe, when where you don't actually agree with the politicians, then um, I'd probably be left with a, a weekend residency at the Galapagos Islands or something. Because, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> this world is is completely messed up right now. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it's no reason to be embarrassed. I, I know it's not the people. Um, it yeah. Politics gets mentioned, and then people get angry. Um, for me personally, I'd rather just go out and play music and make people happy because that's that's what makes me happy. Yep. So, um, but it's a Roger Waters show, so obviously he, he can do exactly what he wants. He to can do, do whatever he, he wants. Does. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not. Sh he can. I'm not sure whether we're welcome back in Turkey either. <gasps> I think they got up. Um, I think the Turkish uh, authorities got quite upset with us at one point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't on the last European tour, so um, I don't know. I ha I haven't asked. I don't ask these things. So I, I stay out of uh, I stay out of politics as much as possible, except when I'm on Twitter sometimes. But you can ignore that. It's just. <laughs> Dave, um, after, all really of, uh, yes. uh, after all these years, you got involved because of yes. After all these years, how's your hearing? Have you got Sorry, experienced go any uh, hearing loss? Huh? What? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Sorry, uh, not at all. No, I from a very early age, I decided that I didn't like the sound of loud electric guitars and loud cymbals when I was rehearsing. Um, probably because at the time I was, I was, uh, I had this transistor amp. In fact, I remember the song we used to play, Sin City by ACDC. That was one of the tunes we used to play. And I'm trying to play these big chords 
and through this transistor amp and it was just taking my taking my head off so i ended up using earplugs from from when i was a teenager so i've i've used earplugs ever since um yep. i use them for gigs i use them on a plane sometimes um i did have my hearing checked for the first time uh, the last time i had some in ears made and um she said wow you've you've got the hearing of a teenager wow you've lost any kind of high end whatsoever which is uh, amazing but as i said for the, for the in ears on stage i i have the volume on you know two maybe yeah it's just i i probably if i'm if i'm in the gym i usually have my ipod louder than than it is on stage to be honest because <laughs> it's just I find easier to um, to uh, to concentrate to keep calm. Yep. Um, you know, because sometimes you walk on stage and there's thirty thousand people and they're all going absolutely crazy. And um, you know, you can you can let that adrenaline affect you. Like that messes up your timing and, and whatever. So I kind of have the volume really quiet and I walk on stage and I just play. And it's, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, this is all good. I've always, yeah, I've always looked after my hearing, basically. It's just, uh, um, it, it seems pointless I, to, 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 um, to damage that. I, and yet so many people I've played with, I mean, Roger's hearing is um, slightly impaired. Um, I used to play with uh, Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer. Yep. Well. And he told me in my heyday, he used to tour, he, he used to have nine Leslies on stage. Wow. I don't know if you can imagine that. I mean, I've stood next to one Leslie, and that is more than enough. So, um, yeah. So, one, one day when we were playing on stage, I made the mistake of walking in front of his monitor, and it almost knocked me over. It was so loud, but his his hearing was just um, was just unfortunately damaged. So, but I get I guess that's what happens with the. From the older generation, they just, just used to play loud before um, mm, mm. they really decent PAs. So, uh, yeah, but I've, I've, I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I was, a, I'm obsessed with it, but I do carry earplugs with me all the time. I, even in cinemas sometimes, if it gets a bit loud, I'll put yep. the earplugs yep. in. It's really sad. Yep. I'm the same, man. <laughs> I, I, I take earplugs with me everywhere. I'm so aware of the damage I've done, and it was at a very young age. I've probably worn earplugs... Right since my late teens early 20s but the damage was already done playing in rock bands sure. and cymbals and i know my left ear i can pinpoint yeah, yeah, it yeah particular band we used to rehearse four nights a week and a small little shed drummer cymbal was right here um can't see my right here <laughs> uh and yeah i now if i'm mixing i do a bit of mixing work and production and when if I'm mixing at whisper quiet levels, I'm listening through the the ringing in my ears, particularly this one, and yeah. Yeah, it's not getting any better. Yeah. And and I've worn the plugs for a long time, but damage was already done. So it's, it's a hazard. Sure. You, it sounds like you got onto it at an yeah. early enough age. Yeah, I mean, I, I just used to. Uh, I, I use the same ones as I as I used. Um, yellow generally <laughs> and you sort of roll them up and you put them in your ear and they're, they're great yeah but um obviously the, the in-ears because they're specially molded to your ears they, they act like earplugs as well they're nice yep in fact i have them just on my yeah they're specially molded to my weird shape ears yeah yeah Nice. I, I have worn the custom molded plugs for a while, although I just did get some cheaper triple flange kind of things, generic ones, which seem to do quite well. Um, mm. the, the, the soft, squishy ones that you're talking about, that that can be a bit off-putting trying to play in those live. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't like those. Um, I've... I just dug them out because the I, I like the, the the hard plastic ones. They kind of work better for me. Yep. Um, those ones they made and I never used them on on tour. But I kind of just I use them for when I'm working out. I'm working out sort of five times a week at the moment, and uh, 
so that's why they're kind of there by my by my bag ready to go to the gym tomorrow yeah um, so uh, uh and they say i'm fine but i just yeah they, they kind of you know when when you get start sweating you can kind of hear the hear the plug kind of moving oh okay yeah as you're as you're moving on this yeah it's, it's weird it's weird i don't like them but i'm just using them because they're there and i don't like wasting stuff so <laughs> yeah yeah dave is there anything you're Bizarre. currently uh working on any educational stuff that you're peddling online or anything that we should direct people towards mm, no no I, I, I spent 13 years i think um teaching at various colleges guitar institute academy of contemporary music writing for transcriptions for guitar techniques um doing instructional videos um did a tv series um i th no I, d I don't feel the need to do any more instructional stuff and i kind of i want to use the time that i've got left to do my own music yep um it's kind of weird but most of my life i've spent playing other people's stuff yeah i don't get paid to, to um to, to play my music which is a kind of a shame really yeah yeah so um so i've been working hard on this on the new album which will be out shortly before the next tour um with roger which starts i believe starts in june next year in america nice so i'll get my album out a couple of weeks before then and um hopefully it'll be successful. i don't know i feel like this is the best thing i've ever done um you know, I still feel like my singing's getting better, I feel like my playing's getting better, my writing's getting better. So, um, who knows? Who knows? I'm I'm really happy with what I've uh, what I've, what I've recorded so far, though. Um, nice. I just have the vocals left to do now. Um, so yeah, I don't want to waste time helping other people. I've already helped. Yeah. Guitarists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It comes a time you've got to start. Yeah, yeah, looking after yourself and getting your own music out there. So when you are recording um, the stuff yeah, that, you, yeah, that you're working that. on, are you um, using any modeling yeah. technology or are you miking up your, your, your rigs? Um, I'm miking up. I'm, I'm going old school. Yep. Um, it's I, just something I about most it. Most of the recording. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the modeling stuff is getting better for sure. Yep. But it, it was, I don't think it allowed for replace the sound of a relamp in a, in a studio with a mic on it there's just some some uh symbiotic relationship i think you know i, I most of the time i'll be actually in the live room we're next to the amp because that's where you're supposed to be if you're recording yeah that's the way they used to do it yeah you know or just sitting sitting in the control room i mean i i, I did that a bit for the last album just because it was easier to kind of because i was doing some experimenting with the pedals and all the pedals were in the control room and the amp was in the live room so it just it was easier but um i still had the, the monitors cranked so you could still feel feel the guitar mm. yeah I've, tr I've tried the and stuff and there's just there's something something missing I, yeah i'm not keen on digital stuff in general you know, it's it's analog or or else really. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, in Australia in particular, um, there was a, the CEO of a, a particular big amp company uh, in Europe was asking me why it is that Australia is their worst market, and I tried to explain to them that it's mostly fly gigs here now because it's such a big. Uh, geographically sure, that yeah, yeah. it's such so big in between that the capitals that you, you you're best off flying so everyone's using modelers now and and i'm really noticing it when i go to a concert and someone's playing through a modelers and that's just coming up through their wedges i'm not getting that on stage sound anymore and, and i've had several guests on who uh i've seen live and they're telling me oh man yeah it's, it's all modeling for, for me now it's undetectable the experience for the that that guy who wants to stand down the front and hear the stage sound just isn't there anymore with those guys but i guess you're very blessed that yeah. you have a crew that you could specify as big a, a rig as you wanted i guess and they'd cut it around for you and set it up 
Yeah, that that is very nice that we ju- we just turn up and all my stuff's already set up. But um, I would do the same, um, even if I didn't have the crew. Um, there's just something about having a real amp with real tubes on stage. Mm. I mean, maybe maybe people will shoot me down for this. I don't know. I, I'm just old school. What can I say? I used to tour. Uh, when I first started playing um, professionally, I just had one amp, one guitar pedal, and um, and a guitar, and that was pretty much it. And I was happy. Yep. You know, um, and I I even went through the uh, getting um, a rack system together. I got an ADA MP1. I got the um, Alessi Alessis, sorry, Quadroverb, and this Marshall Power amp and <laughs> That's a really popular combination. That's exactly what I had. I've still it's got a, my a, old ADA. One. There's an ADA sitting up here. Yeah. If people could see that. Um, and oh, I had yeah, a, I see it. Yep. Yeah. And actually, there's a quadroverb underneath it there as well. So um, that was my right, yes. rig okay. all through the late 80s, early uh, through the 90s. Um, that's what I was using. And at the time, yeah. man, I thought they were great. And I've had several guests see that over my shoulder and go, Hey, that's exactly the rig I, I had back in the day. It was all about the MP1 yeah. and a quadroverb, huh? Yes. Yeah, and I just remember taking it because it was a huge case, huge flight case, really heavy. And I remember I had this Sunday lunchtime gig at a pub somewhere, and I thought, oh, I just cannot be bothered to take all that rack stuff. I'm just going to take my old 50 watt Marshall head, just a cabinet and a pedal. And it was like, oh my God. This is, I've missed this so much. Yeah, yeah. All yep. of a sudden, the guitar is in the same room as you. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the problem with, with those for me. It sounded like the room, the, the amp was next door almost. Um, yeah. And I've tried, I, I did a, a gig with a modeling amp once. And it was, it was a 100 watt combo. And I had it cranked full up. And the sound guy came up to me afterwards. He said, oh, I just want to, Thank you for um, for keeping the volume down on stage. You know, it was, it was really, you know, I'm thinking that was a hundred watt, allegedly, flat out. You know, I would have much rather thirty watt AC thirty because that would have just blown, blown it to pieces. You know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've I've kind of tried and it doesn't. It, for me, it doesn't work. You know. Uh, Dave, can I get you to do the? That, can I get you to do the log yep. out and log back in again, mate? You, you've frozen on me again, but let's do that right now. Yep, sure. I will internet entertain the masses in the meantime. <laughs> he should be back. There he is. Ta-da! There you are. Yes, that's better. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I can go for a little while with it when it freezes on you, but then after a while, it's like. Yeah, it's time to do that thing again. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It's it's usually okay here. I mean, we can watch films here, but um, it's clearly this is taking up more space. I'm I'm not sure whether it, like the the internet is notoriously bad in Australia as well. So um, it okay. could be it could be that. Um, I, Tom Quayle was a bit the same the other day. I might run some tests and just make sure that it's it's not my end of things. But sure. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Dave, I want to say thank you for your time, man. It's been great having a bit of a oh, chat to you. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, you. yeah. I, I, I try and make it as easy as I can on people. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, mate, I, if if you're coming back to Australia, I'm, I'm definitely going to come along and, and see um, Roger Waters if, if that ever happens again, COVID permitting. That's been a real damper of things. Yes, yes, I know this is... The third time I think we've had to reschedule this, this next tour, and um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not even convinced it's going to happen next year. To be honest, at the moment, the market is sort of um, a bit of a mess. Uh, <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So Roger's, uh, Roger's going to be pushing eighty by the time we finish the next tour. I think so. You know. Wow! Wow! Um, I mean, he's he still loves it. He still. Got tons of energy, but um, I don't know. I think if I was his age, I'd just, I'd just want to sit on the beach, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. 
as you would. Maybe, you know, with yeah, a, maybe a career that in Australia. Of all places, well, I live in the probably the best beaches in Australia, right here on the Gold Coast. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome, Dave. I want to you're, thank you for your you're time, very man. Lucky. I am very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very lucky that I get to wake up and have my morning coffees, um, having a chat to people like you. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm trying to round up because I need to go and pee again. <laughs> but I can keep talking to you. Are you? Are you? No, it's 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 fine. I think my my um, girlfriend's going a bit crazy because sure, she hasn't eaten sure. yet. So uh, awesome. She wants to get into the kitchen next door and uh, start yep. cooking stuff. <laughs> yeah, and the internet's come was... come really good uh, as luck would have it. Just as I'm trying to round oh, things up, yeah, yeah, yeah of, of course. course, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um... <laughs> yeah. So but the no, little thank you uh, so much for asking yeah. the applause button that I have on here. People seem to be enjoying that at the moment because they can't get out on the road, and it, they they like to hear a bit of. <laughs> So maybe that will warm the cockles oh. of your soul to, to hear that that kind of clapping. Yes. Yeah, folks, thanks yes. for tuning in again, and yes. I mean, uh, yes, thank you so much to Dave for his time. Uh, it's been nice chatting to you, mate. And I'm going to hit my magic button that rounds it's everything been up. Talking to you too. So, folks, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Hitting the button now. Bam. <laughs>